Let's begin. For this tutorial, I'm going to show you guys how to create a powerful drop, and I'm going to be using my song Dharma with Headhunters. So the first thing that we're going to look at is the bass. There's basically two elements going on here. There's a sub bass and what I call a gritty bass. Now the sub bass is pretty much just a sine wave. The interesting thing to note is all the pitch bends that it's doing. As we go in between different chords or different bass notes, you can see that it's pitch bending up into them. Just creates the tension as you go in between each note and kind of swooshes the listener up and keeps things interesting. The other thing to note is all the different gaps. If you listen here, I've created a rhythm guide, which is playing a little click for all the notes that our melody does. As you can see. Now notice how the bass interacts with that. Now, although it does move around a lot, it's really helpful to have at least some sustained notes because the sub just doesn't move as quickly as other instruments. And it's at its most powerful when you can let it ring out for at least the full beat. So the next thing that we have on top is the gritty bass. And that sounds like this. And what's so important about this layer is it makes your bass feel present in areas of the frequency spectrum that the sub bass just can't touch. It's doing all of the same notes and melody as the sub bass. It just has added accents, as you can see here. The gritty bass is a great way to do interesting things with the bass and make the listener feel like the bass has a lot of movement without messing up your low end because the sub bass that we have would just not be able to handle all of these quick notes and all of the bending. For instance, here, how we go up to the high F, you lose all the power. You have to keep the sub bass at the same octave because there's a very specific region that it works well and you can feel it in. But we're able to trick the listeners here and do a lot of movement with this gritty bass that's on top. We of course cut the low end so it gets out of the way of the sub bass and we have some basic extra things going on like this which gives you a little bit of the hiss that you want, the air that you want from that gritty bass to make it stand out in the mix. And of course one of the most important things is your side chain and here I'm using LFO tool with a curve that is inversely parallel to the waveform of the kick. In other words the bass is fading in just as the kick is fading out. Now let's take a look at the leads. For starters, we have our main lead. I think it's really important in your guys' productions that you pick one sound that you want to be more in front. In this case, it's a silent patch. And after silent, you see we have equality and I'm rolling off the end and the highs. And that's because I have another instrument that we're gonna get to in a few moments that takes care of most of the hiss that you want. Now next we have a little ping pong delay and a little reverb. And this is what really gives it space in the mix. Without it, now with. So as you can see, it's very important. Now next thing is this layer. And what makes it interesting, I think, is it's not just following all the same notes as the lead melody. It's coming in, doing a sort of call and response. It's doing the call here and then leaving a gap for the response. Now, our third layer is actually a duplicate of our lead, just the octave underneath. And it's doing the response as opposed to the call from the pluck. And when you hear them all together, it sounds like this. So as you can see, it's a call, a response, a call, a response. And then on the third one, to keep things interesting, they join each other in unison here. Now, the fourth layer is very important because this gives you all the air that we were talking about. It's pretty much a super saw lead. And if you listen to these three, It really needs support in the high frequencies, and elements like white noise will make your ear pay attention to the other instruments that they're in rhythm with, like in this case our lead synth. So here it is without, and here it is with the fourth layer. 
a lot stronger. One of the interesting things to note about this lead is that we have a lot of volume automation, as you can see here. And if you notice, it's actually not doing the volume automation over the note. It's doing it afterwards in the space where the reverb tail is. It creates this effect of ramping up the reverb tail and making it sort of a suction as we go into the next bar. So I encourage you guys to keep your melodies simple and allow for space. And if you need to fill things up, you can use tricks like this one with the reverb. Now the last thing that I've added is this group of strings. I encourage you guys to use real instruments, contact instruments or sampler instruments to just keep things interesting and less synthy. The next thing that we're gonna look at is our top drums. First, we have white noise. It really opens up the first few beats of the drop. You notice that we have a little bit of side chain going on, but not too much because you really want it to crash right when your drop hits. So listen. The next thing that we have going on supports the end of the melody, and that is the cymbals and the reverse crash. Now you'll notice I have the same crash sample used in two different slots in this drum machine. And I've panned one a little bit to the left and one a little bit to the right. And that way it doesn't sound to the ear like it's the exact same thing happening four times in a row. Listen. And this reverse crash here just glues everything together and brings you back as the loop comes to an end. Next, we're gonna look at the clap. You're gonna notice that it really reinforces the rhythm of our main melody. All of your instruments really should conspire to drive home the rhythm of your melody. Of course, the clap isn't gonna follow the pitch of your melody, but at least it can follow the rhythm of it and really make the listener understand the whole vibe of your drop. Everything in your mix should have a purpose, and it really will be most powerful if they're all on the same page about what notes they're trying to hit and what rhythm. So if we turn on the rhythm guide, you can see that our clap here is really reinforcing the melody. Finally, we're gonna look at these effects vocals that I have. So as you can see, they do a great job of adding tension and making the momentum feel constantly on the up and up. So now let's do a little bit of analysis as to why this drop works. Really, it comes down to a combination of symmetry and movement. Symmetry really just means that some aspects of your melody is repeating. If you change the notes, but the rhythm is the same, you might call that symmetry. And when I say movement, I'm referring to aspects that haven't been repeated. Now, if we take a look at the bass, really the trick here is these two powerful stabs at the beginning. And it happens on the first bar, it also happens in the second bar, and the third bar. That's why I've labeled them A, A, and A. Because although the notes change and they bring about new emotion, rhythmically, they are almost entirely symmetrical. Those first two stabs really serve as an anchor for your listener. And finally, we have B. And this is really important because four repetitions of the same thing in a row really borders on being uninteresting. So we give the listener something that is a deviation and it really makes the listener want to go back home, you could say, or back to the main rhythm. Now let's take a look at the melody. It also shares a lot of symmetry. Now, what you'll notice and what I'm really trying to impart on you guys is the similarities that exist between these sections, each evoking a new emotion, but for the most part, focusing on different orientations of the same three notes, A sharp, C, and C sharp. And the rhythm is perhaps even more symmetrical, experiencing only small evolutions in each section. Take A, for example. Its distinguishing feature is that it has two stabs on the first two kicks, similar to the bass line. 
And when our melody, our bass, and our kick all match up like that, it creates for it an extremely powerful sound, as can be heard in tracks like Tremor. Now the second section, and the third section, they're rhythmically identical, giving you a strong symmetrical pair at the center of your four sections, with one extra note in the third, creating a subtle evolution. Finally, just like in the bass, we have a deviation on C. And that deviation is really what makes you want the whole loop to start back over again and keeps it from being boring. So I hope this helps and all the best.